bienvenue à toutes et à tous. Welcome, welcome. I think we, we should be ready to start. Maybe allow us to take about two minutes to, to all get settled in. We have interpretation in the room. Um, we, are, we are getting ready to have a beautiful and informative um, dialogue. Um, so allow me to just take two minutes as we all get settled in and prepared to have um, a constructive discussion on ending FGM. Thank you so much. All right. Um, if um, allow me to request, if you are not one of the main speakers, go ahead and uh, mute yourself. Um, this is our webinar on the gender transformative approaches to ending FGM. Uh, we are very excited and proud to and honored to be hosting you today. Um, this webinar should not, is recorded, um, as you guys have all noticed, and it should not be taking more than two hours. So we will be engaging you and, um, and making sure that we are all learning. We have a big group of good speakers who are ready to, to share with you our experiences on um, practices in uh, gender transformative approaches around the, the world, actually. Um, my name is Dominica Longa. I am from Rwanda, very proudly, and I will be moderating this event. And uh, without further ado, uh, thank you so much. I would like to give an opportunity to thank our sponsors. Um, as you guys know, this, is, this webinar is the last step of the virtual international stakeholder dialogue on gender transformative approaches to ending female genital mutilation. So the dialogue has been taking place since October and November of this year. It, uh, it gathered about 53 stakeholders from the public sector, from the civil society organization, as well as the UN system. So in total, 33 organizations um, were represented from 21 countries across Africa, Europe, and North America. Uh, and everybody was gathered towards the elimination of FGM. Um, this uh, webinar is organized by ADOS, um, GAMS Belgium, and the AND FGM Un European Network. And it's been supported by UNFPA and UNICEF joint program on the elimination of female genital, uh, genital mutilation and spotlight initiative, basically to eliminate violence against women and girls. And this project was funded, um, the funded project was called Building Bridges Between Africa and uh, Europe to tackle FGM. So basically we are giving a massive word of thank you to our sponsors and also to the 53 stakeholders that have been taking very active role in making these conversations happen and all the organizations from all the countries that have been represented. We are all here to make sure that we take a step forward in ending FGM, but also ending all sorts of gender stereotypes and gender violences. So without further ado today, um, I would like to welcome um, uh, Mireille Tushiminina, uh, who is the coordinator of the UNFPA UNICEF joint program on FGM. If you can give us a few words of welcome and um, your experience. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Dominique. I hope you can hear me. I'm joining from Addis. 
first, I would like to greet everyone. Donc, uh, bonjour, wherever you are in the world, and uh, good afternoon for those in the same time zone as uh, myself here in Addis. I am really thrilled to be opening this panel today as uh, in my role as the global coordinator of the UNFPA UNICEF joint program. As you all know, it's one of the largest global program on the elimination of um, genital mutilation and uh, let me start that you know by thinking idols and you guys are really one of our trusted uh, partner and uh, also GAMS Belgium and the end FGM European Network for organizing this virtual international stakeholder uh, um, a dialogue with 53 stakeholders, as Dominic has already mentioned, from uh, previous sector, the public sector, civil society, UN system, as I'm seeing some of our data fellows as well in the room, and representing 33 organizations from 21 countries uh, across Africa, Europe, North um, America working towards the elimination of female genital mutilation. Uh, we gather here today as a result of the dialogue, and this dialogue were much needed as FG Uh, do bear with us as um, Madame Mireille Tushiminina comes back. Uh, we, the internet is uh, one of the things that we need to, um, to be patient with. So as soon as she comes back, we will allow her to, to come back with her speech. As we, as we wait for um, Madame Mireille uh, Tushiminina, uh, I would like to help uh, to welcome the audience. Um, if you can use the chat room to uh, introduce yourself um, and to say what country you're joining us from, uh, that would be great. If you can engage with us in the chat room, the, the entire team is here to, to hear from you and we're very excited about that. And um, as we wait for her again, I would like to go ahead and, um, Intro and, and tell you what we should be expecting today. Um, so we are having a bilingual uh, event. If you need interpretation, feel free to click the interpretation button just under. Um, I am bilingual, je vais essayer de parler en français uh, de temps en temps, uh, mais c'est pas vraiment ma langue principale, donc uh, il faut me pardonner. <laughs> uh, mais après, la, le, 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 the speech, huh? après uh, uh, the speech of Madame Tushiminina, we have an online dialogue finding report presentation with uh, Stephanie and Marianne Nguena Kana. Um, so, oh yes, we have uh, Madame Mireille back. Please go ahead. My apologies is I'm in Addis, so I got logged out and I was talking and I realized that I was no longer online. So I'm joining you guys by phone, is that okay? Absolutely no worries. Yes, so let me just uh, finish and then we'll continue with the program. I am so sorry. Um, I mean, that's the beauty of uh, working virtually. Um, well, well, let me just continue where I left off. Uh, since the Beijing Declaration until today, the global consensus has been that the elimination of FGM of FGM contributes to the achievement of gender equality in line with this argument. Okay, one of, I was muted by the, okay. One of the important lessons learned for the three phases of the joint program has been uh, adopting gender transformative programming, which is really critical to achieve the elimination of FGM and gender equality at all level. A gender transformative approach um, prioritized the agencies of girls and women to exercise um, 
to exercise their right and influence the decision-making processes to avoid FGM. The approach involves empowering women, girls, and the community to question and transform unfair power dynamics and inequitable gender norms into positive social values to enhance equality. Working across level and within a web of support that involves families and communities, society and public structures and, and institutions, a system and services, the gender transformative approach ensures that social actors, especially men and boys, who are often left out of traditional gender mainstreaming, despite their vital roles in reinforcing gender inequalities are involved. This should be also accompanied by appreciating diversity and context-specific intervention across countries and region. Evidence shows that gender transformative is possible, but can also be, can also be long-term, is often generational, and needs sustained investment over time, especially within the context of elimination of FGM. In the last two decades, by diverting the focus from gender sensitive programming to gender transformative programming, joint program result shows that attitudes towards FGM are shifting. In countries affected by FGM, seven in 10, um, 10 girls and women think the practice should end. Even among communities that practice FGM, there is a notable level of opposition. Among girls and women who themselves have been subjected to FGM, five in 10 think the practice should end. The proportion of girls of women in high prevalence countries who, uh, who wants to practice to stop as double. Adolescent girls are more likely than older women to oppose FGM, which is the case that we see in Egypt, Guinea, Sierra Leone. Adolescent girls are at least 50% more likely than older women to oppose the practice. It is critical to recognize that men and boys are visible partners and allies against FGM. We still have a long way to go. However, we are quite optimistic. Uh, today, we have, uh, we have a different yet very important change makers and, and, and advocates who play a key role, not only in bringing global awareness of FGM, but also in holding the international community accountable to end these harmful practices. Let me just remind all of us that we are not alone on the road to eliminate FGM. We have you with us who are committed to end FGM. We have youth who will play a catalytic, a catalytic and and a really critical role uh, for the next phase who are determined to end FGM. We have governments and policy maker with us to abandon FGM. So my last word to everyone will be, let's continue to march to meet our goal to eliminate FGM by 2030, despite all the challenges. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, indeed, let's continue to march to make sure that uh, we end FGM by 2030. And I believe it's definitely possible. I would like to welcome uh, Madame Stéphanie uh, Florquin uh, for our interpretation of Madame Mireille's speech in uh, French, because we are still having a bit of interpretation problems. If you can um, unmute yourself and just give us a quick uh, summary in French. Thank you so much. Euh, oui, bonjour. Je ne suis pas sûre de pouvoir bien euh, synthétiser ce que, ce que madame euh, a, tout a dit, euh, mais euh, elle a commencé par remercier les organisations qui organisent euh, ce, cet événement, donc IDOS, le Games Belgique et le réseau européen NFGM European Network, qui sont des partenaires de, du programme conjoint euh, UNFPA-UNICEF pour mettre fin, pour éliminer les, les mutilations génitales féminines. Um, et elle a souligné que um, implémenter des approches transformatrices de genre pour mettre fin aux MGF, c'est possible, mais par contre, ça prend du temps. Et donc, voilà, on va rentrer sure, plus but en... It will take a long term. Uh... Um, pendant cette conférence. Uh, et elle a appelé uh, chacune et chacun à continuer ensemble à marcher pour une fin uh, des MGF pour uh, 2030. Voilà, je m'excuse d'avance pour... <rire> voilà, parce que je ne m'attendais pas à la traduction, mais j'espère que, que j'ai synthétisé à peu près euh, ce que euh, Madame Touchimine a dit. 
Merci beaucoup, Stéphanie. Elle a aussi dit qu'elle pense... Elle est pense... le estimé. Elle, elle a aussi dit qu'elle pense que c'est possible d'éliminer le FGM en 2030 si on, on, on travaille tous ensemble comme euh, organisation hommes-femmes euh, en général. Donc, euh, c'était un très beau message. Merci. Um, I am quickly going to jump back in English, uh, dear audience. Uh, once again, I am so excited and honored to be part of this conversation, and I hope that you're starting to learn a lot. We will be jumping with, a, as you can see on our screen, we have the, um, the agenda so you can know how far we are and where we're going. But right now, we're going to, to welcome again uh, Stéphanie Florquin, uh, who is the uh, coordinator uh, of COPFGM, and she also has been the one who, um, this, uh, who talked about this um, dialogue in the English group. Um, and then we also have Marianne Guenacana, who is the project coordinator at GAMS Belgium. Uh, I'm welcoming them on the stage. Uh, we just have a few few questions to, to ask them and interact with them. Um, they moderated together um, a group on the conversation and they will be sharing with us what are the, the methodologies, what were the findings, the recommendations. Um, so welcome Marianne and Stephanie. Um, would you like to let us know which language you'll be comfortable talking in? Yes, so I will be speaking in English and Marianne will be speaking in French. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay. Yes, so my first question will be um, um, to Stéphanie, uh, if you can introduce um, to us what the discussion was, what was the, you know, the metholo methodologies that you have found, uh, especially with a special focus on the diversity of the, the participants, what happened and, you know, briefly tell us about that. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Dominique. So as uh, already said in the introduction statements, so this uh, discussion was, was held within the framework of the building bridges between Africa and Europe uh, to end FGM. It's a project supported by the UNFPA and UNICEF joint program for the elimination of FGM and the Spotlight Initiative. And it was held within the frame of the community of practice on FGM, which is an online uh, community of stakeholders involved in the prevention and uh, the care, uh, the prevention of FGM and the care uh, and support to survivors of the practice. Uh, it was obviously a, an online uh, dialogue uh, and in order to ensure the most uh, inclusive possible, the uh, and most inclusive possible um, inclusion possible um, and the, the participation of a maximum number of stakeholders, we held this uh, dialogue in two languages, so in French and in English. It's also in line with uh, the way that the community of practice works because we uh, function in two languages. Uh, so English and French. Um, the discussions uh, were, were held, so there were two groups uh, that met three times, one Anglophone group, one, one Francophone group. Um, and each group was facilitated by two expert moderators. So in the English group, it was Cynthia Umurungi, who unfortunately could not um, be here today, but I was her uh, supporting uh, moderator. So that's why I'm, I'm speaking to you today. Um, um, if I can just jump in really quickly, yeah. we have a group of uh, an interpreters who are trying to follow you. If you could just kind of Sorry. <laughs> slow down a bit, that would be wonderful. But thank yes, you. Yes, so of course. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so I was saying that the first, um, the English speaking group was moderated by Cynthia Umurungi, uh, who could unfortunately not be here today, and I was her supporting uh, moderator, so that's why I'm presenting today, alongside Marianne and Gwena Kana, who was the moderator of the Franco uh, Francophone group, with the support of Clara Caldera from idols. Um, and really the main objective of this process, uh, as was already stated also in the introduction, uh, is to support the development of practical and promising gender transformative approaches to FGM uh, through mutual learning, identification of best practices, and collectively setting a set of recommendations for key stakeholders uh, in order to implement such programs. Um, the work built on and also provides suggestions uh, for the implementation of the Gender Equality Forum uh, and especially the Action Coalitions 1 and 3. Uh, and as uh, stated, the groups met three times. This was in October and November. Um, we first started by making sure that everyone had a shared definition of what is gender transformative 
approaches. Oh, sorry, there's a microphone. Yeah, thank you. Um, and uh, how to implement them. And we were trying to reflect on uh, which uh, practices by, by the participants could already be given as good practices. And if, if yes, how? Um, we also identify challenges uh, of implementing such uh, gender transformative approaches in anti-FGM programming specifically. And at the end, we looked at how the challenges can be uh, addressed and how we proposed uh, concrete possible solutions and promising practices for this. So I'm very happy to announce that the, the report of this uh, dialogue has just been published uh, a few minutes ago uh, on the Community of Practice uh, website. So someone is going to share. Uh, yeah, the link is already in the, in the chat. Um, so you can go and have a look at that. Unfortunately, I mean, after the conference, obviously. Um, but uh, unfortunately, for at the moment, it's uh, only in English. So for those who are uh, reading in French, you will just have to wait a few weeks, uh, one or two weeks, and then the report will be published in, in French as well on the CUP website. Thank you so much, Stephanie. This, uh, I mean, I'm so excited that this project is bringing together so much recommendations and, and things that we all can use to make sure that we, we create a safer world for, uh, for women and men as well. Um, I would like to jump quickly to bring Marianne in. Um, I will ask the question in French and attempt with a little bit of English, but was it hard to, to kind of come together in defining or understanding um, what a gender uh, transformative approach is? Um, how, how, how was it? Was it hard? Was it easy? What was your fi fi finding, especially around that? In French, uh, trying, est-ce que c'était difficile ou facile de s'accorder une notion, définition, compréhension commune sur les approches trans trans transformatrices du genre? Uh, Marianne, si vous pouvez uh, répondre. Merci beaucoup. Merci Dominique. Bonjour à tous et à toutes. Hein. Donc euh, oui, hein, enfin, voilà, approche transformatrice de genre, c'était euh, la grosse thématique. Et euh, d'entrée de jeu, euh, voilà, je voudrais préciser ici hein, que c'est vraiment euh, la, la, la synthèse hein, finalement de ce rapport hein, qui, euh, qui sera disponible très bientôt. Et donc, euh, à l'entame de ce dialogue, euh, le premier constat finalement de terrain qu'on a pu euh, observer, c'est que les, les différents participants et participantes avaient chacun et chacune une conception des approches transformatrices de genre et, euh, et, et le faisaient déjà dans le cadre de leur projet sur le terrain. Mais je dirais que ça a été assez compliqué de pouvoir s'accorder sur une compréhension finalement commune hein, de ce que sont les approches finalement qui questionnent, qui visent à changer les normes de genre. Et euh, finalement, on est parti euh, sur un constat commun que euh, voilà, les, les définitions euh, clés notamment étaient nécessaires pour pouvoir euh, mieux comprendre ce, finalement ce concept. Et donc, voilà, à travers ces, euh, ce petit exercice finalement qui permettait justement de pouvoir... Euh, 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 prendre en compte hein, ou alors euh, mais, enfin, maîtriser les, différentes, euh, les différents concepts clés. Euh, voilà, on, on a pu euh, justement s'accorder partie d'un point euh, commun euh, qui était le constat que finalement les mutilations génitales féminines sont étroitement liées aux relations de pouvoir, inégales aussi bien entre les hommes que les femmes, et finalement qu'elles constituent une forme de violence basée sur le genre. Pourquoi en tant que finalement que manifestation euh, de l'égalité entre les genres et, euh, et finalement que cette inégalité devrait être traitée euh, justement par des approches qui visent non seulement à éradiquer la pratique en tant que telle, mais aussi finalement à transformer les normes sociales et les relations de pouvoir entre les genres qui l'ont produite et qui voilà, participent à maintenir la pratique. Je dirais également qu'à euh, la suite de voilà, finalement définir les petits concepts clés pour mieux comprendre la terminologie, le concept d'approche transformatrice de genre, voilà, on a pu justement avec l'outil euh, le continuum de l'équité de genre, hein, finalement, qui est un outil qui décrit finalement les différentes étapes hein, pour atteindre l'égalité entre les genres qui peuvent être adoptées justement pour évaluer 
justement le potentiel de la programmation et de la politique pour traiter euh, des normes de genre néfastes et, euh, et des relations de pouvoir. Et donc, à travers ce continuum, cet outil-là, justement, euh, il a permis aussi aux différentes participants de décrire finalement dans quelle mesure les approches spécifiques pouvaient justement contribuer à transformer euh, les relations de pouvoir entre, euh, entre les gens dans la société. Et donc, voilà, ce concept a vraiment été au cœur hein, des différentes discussions de ce dialogue. Et donc, voilà, nous sommes parvenus finalement à se dire, OK, l'adoption d'une approche finalement qui vise à re-questionner les normes sociales et les normes de genre nécessite quoi Alors, on a voilà, établi un certain nombre de points d'attention, justement, que ces approches-là ou ces programmes qui prennent en considération le changement de normes devraient intégrer. Premièrement, ce serait d'aller au-delà de la simple inclusion des femmes comme participantes, mais aussi, finalement, de promouvoir l'autodétermination des filles et des femmes ou de simplement impliquer les hommes dans un programme pour remplir, finalement, les conditions euh, nécessaire pour que le programme soit euh, sensible au genre. Mais aussi, euh, un point d'attention a été également mis sur le fait qu'il était nécessaire, finalement, de créer des opportunités pour les individus qui leur permettraient de contester effectivement les normes de genre, mais aussi de promouvoir les positions d'influence sociale et politique voilà, pour les femmes dans les différentes communautés. Et donc, voilà, ceci passe également par s'attaquer justement aux inégalités de pouvoir entre les personnes de sexes différents, mais aussi à s'attaquer finalement aux causes profondes de l'inégalité entre les genres. Et on s'est également accordé sur le fait qu'il fallait aller au-delà et pouvoir redresser finalement les dynamiques et les structures de pouvoir qui servent à renforcer les inégalités entre les genres en faisant à la fois participer les hommes, les femmes, les filles, les garçons et en remettant justement en question les normes et pratiques genrées euh, qui sont néfastes telles que les mutilations génitales féminines. Et donc, voilà, au, au final, vraiment, c'était de se dire allons au-delà de l'autonomisation des femmes et des filles et remettons réellement en question l'ordre social qui a conduit à cette inégalité de genre. Et donc, les approches finalement qui visent à re-questionner les normes de genre comprennent finalement des mesures qui visent aussi bien à informer, à sensibiliser et voire même transformer finalement les hommes et les jeunes garçons sur les questions aussi bien des masculinités toxiques, mais également la remise en question des normes liées au genre et les stéréotypes sexistes qui sont fortement nuisibles et qui, justement, pourraient favoriser l'autonomisation des femmes et des filles. Et donc, concrètement, au niveau de les, des approches qui visent à changer les normes de genre dans le domaine des mutilations génitales féminines, parce que c'est le cas, ça a été le cas, justement, c'est de se dire, OK, donc pour un programme ou un projet euh, transformateur voilà, qui re-questionne ces normes de genre-là, il était important de pouvoir euh, remettre en cause les rôles de genre et les dynamiques de pouvoir entre les sexes, ensuite encourager une réelle prise de conscience critique des rôles et des normes de genre et finalement remettre en question les différents coûts de ces normes de genre qui seraient néfastes et nuisibles voilà, et inéquitables, pardon, notamment les MGF. Donc voilà un petit peu. Merci. Merci beaucoup, Marianne. Avant que je te laisse t'en aller, euh, j'aimerais bien que, que tu, nous, tu, tu nous expliques est -ce que, comment est-ce que les gens sont en train de le voir Comment est-ce qu'ils sont en train d'adopter euh, tout ce que tu es en train de dire, la masculinité toxique, les, les différents euh, rôles, la supériorité des hommes dans nos sociétés Est-ce qu'ils sont en train de comprendre et de et d'intégrer ça dans leur vie de tous les jours, dans leur com communauté. Euh, oui, oui, Dominique, je dirais, en participant à ce dialogue, les différents participants des organisations de la société civile ont déjà entamé ce processus. Hein. Je tiens à préciser ici, c'est quelque chose qui est déjà entamé sur le terrain voilà, depuis plusieurs années. Et donc, voilà, il y avait... Il y a de bonnes pratiques qui ont déjà été amorcées, mais voilà, euh, qui ne sont pas encore, voilà, on n'est pas encore, voilà, encore dans la, la, la belle case, encore réellement qui, est, qui transforme, qui, qui re-questionne et qui permet justement euh, des rapports de genre égalitaires euh, dans la société. Donc, effectivement, les participants et participantes ont déjà. Ont des pro programmes soit considérants ou sensibles au genre. 
Voilà, mais voilà, la question se travaille déjà. Donc, c'est pas, on ne vient pas de zéro, quoi. Je veux dire, euh, voilà, les participants font des, les, les, les différentes organisations qui ont participé à ce dialogue font déjà beaucoup sur le terrain. Et, euh, et voilà, et je pense que à, à travers ce qui va suivre, les, les différentes présentations, voilà, on verra comment mieux les soutenir pour pouvoir arriver à des programmes et des projets plus. Euh, euh, transformateur de gens, si je puis dire. Merci. Merci beaucoup, absolument. Et je reviens encore sur euh, Stéphanie. Um, I hope, I'm hoping as I'm speaking in French and English that the interpretation is also doing um, a, a helpful job to those who are following us in the different languages. Uh, but to Stéphanie, uh, given this uh, elaborate definition of gender transformative approaches that Marianne has just given us, um, could you tell us more on the state of implementation on the ground uh, in the anti-FGM anti, um, sector. So Marianne has started, but if you can really uh, elaborate and give us more detail, that would be great. Thank you so much. Yes, of course. So, so first of all, uh, I want to say that there, there was agreement in the group that gender transformative approaches is increasingly popular among international stakeholders, uh, even national stakeholders, and also donors but that at the same time there are in reality rather few uh, fully gender transformative approaches in the anti-FGM sector currently. So as already said by my Mireille and Marianne, uh, the process has started, we're not starting from zero, but we're seeing that what's happening is not, is not uh, enough still. Um, so we had examples during the dialogue of innovative programs that adopt a truly gender transformative approach uh, to gender-based violence, for example, but not necessarily always to FGM. Um, so these, these programs can help support the anti-FGM programs, and we will hear more about them a little bit later during the presentations, uh, and they can really uh, inspire, inspire us all. Um, And at the same time, we also wanted to emphasize, and it was emphasized during the groups, that there are a lot of organizations uh, at the grassroots level who are doing a lot of work, as Marianne said, uh, and they're not necessarily using the terminology of gender transformative approaches. Uh, it's, uh, it's not a, a term that's always uh, well understood or well known by everyone. It's a quite technical term still. Um, And it doesn't mean that, that no one is doing anything and there are programs that are transformative or, or that are on the way of, of transforming gender relations uh, and at the same time um, bringing about change in terms of ending FGM. Um, and so what, um, what, what we wanted to say as well is that while there are a lot of, of, of programs that are implemented uh, and a lot of programs also even claiming to be gender transformative, what we see is that when we look at programs, they're not always um, fulfilling all the requirements. So they're doing parts of the work, but they're not necessarily uh, managing to cover everything. Um, so the tool that Marianne was speaking about, the gender continuum tool, it really helps to understand and to analyze the, the project and to see, okay, you can, uh, you can recognize that gender inequalities Uh, you can even respond to them and you can actively try to accommodate the needs of both women, girls, men and, and boys in your programs. Uh, but sometimes the programs do not fully uh, treat the root causes of gender inequality. And sometimes there is still a bit of work that needs to be done in order to really push the change in terms of gender norms and gender power relations. Uh, these power relations that, as we know, advantage Boy, boys and girls as a group uh, above uh, women and, and, uh, and girls in society. Um, and we will get back a little bit to the challenges and the reasons why uh, currently the, like not everyone can do everything. Um, I mean, cl clearly as Marianne was saying, there needs to be more support to programs because gender transformative approaches take a lot of time and, uh, and demand resources. So that's something that we're gonna, gonna come back to as well. It's really important to stress. Um, undoubtedly, um, implementing gender transformative approaches to ending FGM is ambitious. Uh, it's extremely necessary if we need to, if we want to end gender inequalities and gender-based violence at large. Um, if we implement, um, anti-FGM programming without consideration of the larger gender inequalities, we risk to uh, maintain gender inequalities 
in other in other areas as they are and we can even implement uh, programs that would reinforce gender inequalities and that would reinforce other types of gender-based violence so this is super important and there was really agreement on that in the in the international stakeholder dialogue um what i also wanted to to add maybe to 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 end on this question was that um having one program that's fully gender transformative is kind of a utopia in a way so it's very difficult for one organization or one project to to reach all the levels of society that you need to reach in order to fully change uh, the root cause of gender inequality so what we emphasized a lot was that organizations need to work together uh, it's only by working together that we can reach all the different levels of society because it's impossible for one organization to do everything, or at least it's very difficult. Uh, but everyone can contribute to this process that Mireille was also speaking about, and everyone can do something for in order for together uh, get together and actually uh, bring about a truly gender transform trans gender transformation in in society. Uh, so yeah, I think that's that's really what I wanted to want what I'm to, wanted to stress that the work has started, but we need more support and we need more time as well. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, um, I really want to bring you both back, uh, whoever wants um, to, to feel comfortable to answer uh, between you and Marianne um, around, again, um, the challenges that the participants uh, identified um, as they were telling you we're about to um, implement this, but these are the challenges that we're, we're, we've, we're identifying. And if we can um, answer this as a summary, so we can have at least 10 to 15 minutes for the audience to, um, to, answer, to also ask you some questions, because this is uh, very heavy content that I believe they will like to engage with. Thank you so much. What uh, challenges have the participants themselves identified in making sure that they implement uh, gender transformative approaches? Oui, oui, merci Dominique. Euh, je dirais que les défis, comme, Steph, comme Stéphanie vient de le dire, il y en a beaucoup. Hein. Je veux dire, les acteurs et actrices de terrain euh, font face à, une, à un nombre incalculable de défis. Et, euh, et justement, euh, voilà, en, en termes de, de contraintes, voilà, c'est euh, un des éléments importants à prendre en considération. Et donc, euh, voilà, c'est aussi un point d'attention euh, sur lequel on, on, on voudrait un petit peu s'apesantir. Et donc, voilà, en plus de ce que euh, Stéphanie venait de mentionner, hein, aussi bien la question euh, de la standardisation, finalement, de la terminologie, mais aussi... Euh, voilà, de la reconnaissance, de l'harmonisation finalement, de la reconnaissance que les, de la reconnaissance que les, 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 les programmes, les approches qui visent à changer les normes de genre sont une priorité. Voilà, c'est un des, 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 des principaux défis aussi. Mais en plus de ça, comme, comme elle a également mentionné, la question du temps, du coût d'une telle approche. Et, euh, et voilà, et c'est aussi un des éléments qui est beaucoup revenu lors des discussions, c'est que finalement, pour les participants, euh, en raison parfois euh, de la nature, aussi bien à long terme, des approches qui visent à requestionner les normes sociales et de genre, euh, voilà, ça demande beaucoup de temps. Et euh, avant de pouvoir es escompter un certain changement, et parfois certaines organisations, voilà, ne donnent pas forcément la priorité à ce type d'approche. Et, et voilà, c'est une des principales euh, contraintes. Mais également, euh, l'un des défis majeurs aussi qu'on a pu euh, euh, identifier, c'est euh, finalement, hein, je reviens à ce que Stéphanie disait, le manque de bonnes pratiques existantes euh, dans l'application d'une approche euh, qui requestionne les normes de genre dans le domaine spécifique des mutilations génitales féminines, aussi bien euh, dans les différents contextes que ce soit nationaux, culturels et religieux. Et donc, voilà, on va dire que voilà, de nombreuses interventions justement peuvent... Euh, voilà, être efficace finalement sur le terrain dans la lutte contre les mutilations génitales féminines, mais n'entraîne pas forcément la transformation du système, ne re-questionne pas finalement les rôles de genre et les normes sociales qui soutiennent les inégalités de sexe. Donc euh, voilà, on a par exemple, hein, il y a plein d'approches communautaires euh, euh, qui ont été euh, identifiées, hein, voilà, présentées, qui se, fait déjà, qui se font sur le terrain par les, les, les acteurs et actrices. Euh, Notamment, euh, ces approches-là visent 
et s'attaque justement avec succès aux mutilations génitales féminines, mais, mais voilà, ça continue quand même à attribuer des rôles et des responsabilités différentes, en attribuant pardon, des rôles et des responsabilités différentes aussi bien aux hommes qu'aux femmes, qu'aux dirigeants communautaires ou, ou au monde de la, de la communauté. Donc voilà. Et euh, en plus de ces défis-là, je dirais qu'on on observe également voilà, une multitude de défis aussi bien au niveau des individus, au niveau de la communauté et au niveau de la société en général. Donc, c'est vraiment euh, tout le, voilà, la vision générale de, la, de, de voilà, les différentes sphères euh, d'action sur lesquelles voilà, il, il faudrait euh, euh, agir. Et donc, je veux dire, au niveau individuel, par exemple, la résistance des individus euh, est fort marquée, notamment dans la remise en question des normes de genre et à l'abandon des privilèges. Et donc, c'est un des éléments qui transforme paraissait justement dans ce dialogue, la question notamment des hommes et des jeunes garçons qui ne sont pas assez impliqués dans les programmes de lutte contre les mutilations génitales féminines, mais aussi le fait que finalement pour ce public masculin, voilà, ils ne voient pas toujours les mutilations génitales féminines comme un, pro un problème d'inégalité de sexe. Et, euh, et, voilà. et parfois, lorsqu'on implique ce public masculin-là voilà, dans les programmes de lutte contre les MGF, les mutilations génitales féminines, excusez-moi, voilà, ils ne sont pas toujours voilà, prêts à remettre en question le privilège. Et donc, c'est vraiment un, un défi euh, euh, fort, euh, fort, euh, qui est fort revenu pardon, euh, à, euh, au cours de ce dialogue-là. Également, euh, la question euh, des, des, des filles et des femmes, justement, qui n'ont pas bien qu'ils n'ont pas souvent voilà, la possibilité de défendre leurs droits, car elles n'ont pas le pouvoir de décision dans leur communauté. Je veux dire, voilà, au niveau des individus, il y a quand même pas mal, des individus, de, 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 pas mal de défis, euh, ce qui complique justement euh, la mise en œuvre euh, d'approches finalement qui, qui, qui transforment les, les normes de genre. Et donc, les projets justement euh, qui visent à remettre en question les normes de genre euh, créeront, voilà, inévitablement, certainement aussi, hein, des tensions ou des conflits entre les membres de la communauté, les parents, les hommes, aussi bien euh, euh, les, les, les responsables, hein, justement, de la mise en œuvre des programmes et des projets. Et donc, ces défis-là sont, euh, voilà, ce sont, euh, ce sont des défis qui ont, qui ont été euh, fort euh, euh, indexés par les, les acteurs et les actrices de terrain. Par ailleurs, on a également euh, pu euh, identifier comme, euh, comme, gros, hein, comme gros défi aussi euh, que les, finalement les approches qui remettent, qui re-questionnent les normes de genre ne sont pas généralement une priorité pour les communautés voilà, qui sont généralement résistantes au changement. Et donc, voilà, il y a justement ce rapport-là des rôles de chaque membre de la communauté dans la perpétuation de la pratique telle que les MGF et euh, la manière dont les décisions sont prises parfois par les individus aussi bien au niveau familial euh, que voilà, dans les organisations, dans la société, voilà, aborde les, les déséquilibres de pouvoir entre les genres et entre les générations. Et euh, il a également été souligné finalement que les jeunes générations ont moins de pouvoir que les personnes les plus âgées dans les communautés et que le peu de pouvoir que ces jeunes générations-là ont est encore réduit quand il s'agit de femmes et de filles. Et donc, les hommes et, euh, et les femmes de la communauté jouent également voilà, parfois des rôles très différents, hein, finalement, dans la perpétuation de la pratique des mutilations génitales féminines, car, voilà, au final, ce sont des filles… C'est vraiment un long projet, euh, un trajet, mais on, 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 on devrait continuer, on devrait… Oui. On devrait vraiment continuer euh, cette lutte-ci et, et, et vraiment je me dis que éventuellement la société, la communauté comprendra et, et c'est important que la, la génération des jeunes est en train au fait euh, en effet d'essayer de, 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 de parler de ce problème-ci. Donc c'est déjà une, une assez grande euh, étape. Merci beaucoup Marianne. Euh, J'aimerais inviter encore Stéphanie, elle a une présentation sur les recommandations, euh, comme ça on, on, on a une, une, une idée un peu plus détaillée. Merci beaucoup Marianne. Je t'en prie. Yes, uh, thank you, Dominique. I, I'll keep to be, I'll try to be um, quick, but speak slowly. Um, so, of course, as, as I already said in the introduction, the aim of this uh, 
international stakeholder dialogue was really to give concrete recommendations for different stakeholders uh, and recognizing that the uh, in order to achieve long lasting change, uh, we need to implement a multi sectoral intervention which cut across all the different levels of society so that's why it's really important to engage both uh, with uh, civil society with donors with governments with policymakers. Um, so. For each, um, for each recommendation, as you will see uh, in the report, we also link them to the Gender Equality Forum Action Coalitions. So that's very important also so that we can really concretely see how to, how to implement the Gender Equality Forum. So uh, for the donors, uh, I'm gonna just emphasize on a few points. So there's really a need to support the development of more complex and increasingly gender transformative approaches. So as we've said repeatedly, these type of approaches they, they require time and they do require funding and they require uh, intervention at different levels. Um, organizations need to be uh, capable of working consortiums. So one good practice that we wanted to emphasize is really the support to consortiums and to creation of new networks between organizations for the, for the donors. Uh, for the donors to support them, I mean. Um, we really encourage donors as well to create networking uh, and knowledge exchange opportunities for their grantees. So for example, grantees uh, who are working on a similar uh, funding line. Um, and we also really encourage funding uh, for building capacities uh, and skills. Um, so next slide. Yeah, so for the governments, of course, governments also have an important role to play in terms of uh, funding programs. So that's uh, one first uh, recommendations for, for governments and policymakers is to give money to this kind of long lasting, uh, long term uh, gender transformative programming. Um, we really encourage policymakers and governments to uh, provide suggestions um, in their policies on how to implement gender uh, transformative approaches. So gender transformative approach need to be included in the design of policies. And of course, especially those that are linked to gender equality, sexual reproductive health and rights, gender-based violence, and of course, those uh, specifically addressing FGM. It's very important that women and girls and especially survivors of the practice are involved in the des design of uh, policies. Um, and Governments also can play a key role in implementing comprehensive sexual education into schools, into school curricula. Uh, and this means ensuring that adequate attention to uh, girls and boys bodily autonomy is, uh, in, is involved, is implemented uh, in, in this, in these comprehensive sexual education, that there is attention given to harmful practices such as FGM, and that there is also emotional and relationship um, education. And then the next step. So the next set of recommendations is for civil society. So here, uh, once again, we really emphasize the, the need to work in coalitions. Not everyone cannot do everything, but everyone can do something. Um, so promote knowledge exchange and work together in order to ensure that gender transformative programming is really made possible at all levels of society. Um, we need to include all different groups in society. So men, as already said, but only working with men is not enough. Uh, working with women of different ages, including senior women, professionals, of course, and religious and other traditional leaders. Um, and including an intergenerational element is also very important um, because that's a way of addressing, of making sure that those who are in power in society are also involved in this work. And that's, that's of course, crucial in order to bring change. Um, we encourage holistic programs. So those, for example, aiming at increasing the well-being of girls um, and really a well-being in the broad sense and not focusing only on FGM. Um, and finally, in order to measure um, the, the transformation and how, it's, how it happens over the long term, we need new tools. So we need new tools to measure progress, progress and also to ev uh, evaluate the, the programs. Uh, one way of doing that is, of course, to work with uh, academic institutions. So that's also something that we encourage civil society actors to do. And then just a little final note is for organizations who want to implement gender transformative approaches, we really also encourage them to look inwards and to look at how their own uh, organizational um, structure um, helps 
change society uh, and whether they are not reproducing gender inequality in, in, internally within the organizations. It's very important when doing this work to be introspective. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for a, a great presentation. Um, we have uh, six minutes left before uh, jumping into the next session. Um, if the audience has a question for Stephanie and Marianne and their you know, a very in-depth uh, conversation that we just had, please uh, unmute yourself very, very, very briefly and tell us who you want to address the question to and pose uh, your question. We only have enough time for two questions, unfortunately, so yes. Uh, and please remember, just ask your question to uh, whoever is, um, was the speaker. Thank you so much. Um, if you prefer to use the chat room, the chat box as well, I will be reading the question if that's easier for you. Well, um, we see if there are any questions. Maybe I just wanted to add that the, the discussion around gender transformative approaches has continued within the community of practice on FGM. And so on the CUP website, I saw my colleague shared um, the, some of the links. So on the CUP website, you can also find the, the, the results of the discussion that's still ongoing. And there's been a very interesting discussion around working with men. Uh, that that we published, uh, of which we published the results uh, just a few days ago. So uh, for those who are not yet members, don't hesitate to go and have a look. Um, and of course, uh, if anyone wants to join the community of practice, that's also very easy to do uh, by going on the on the website. Thank you, thank you. Um, I'm giving you a chance. Uh, you can raise your hand, unmute yourself. Um, just about five seconds. If after five seconds there's no question, I will assume that this was very clear and very detailed and we will move to yet another engaging uh, conversation. Thank you. Si personne ne prend la parole, je voudrais juste revenir sur un, un commentaire que j'ai trouvé très intéressant dans le chat euh, de Fabienne, qui disait justement que le fait que les hommes ne remettent pas en cause leurs privilèges est universel, exactement. Et euh, voilà, donc ce n'est pas qu'une question euh, forcément rattachée euh, euh, aux, aux communautés qui pratiquent les mutilations génitales féminines. Donc, euh, merci pour la précision. Je ne sais pas si je peux euh, ajouter quelque chose, un commentaire. Bien sûr, bien sûr. Merci beaucoup. Voilà, je voulais juste euh, dire, parce que voilà, j'ai travaillé plusieurs années à l'Institut de médecine tropicale d'Anvers, où on apprenait aux étudiants à écrire des projets, en fait. Euh, et euh, une des, des projets de coopération au développement, et une des remarques qu'on avait, c'était que le mot « genre » n'était pas tellement connu et parfois a été rajouté à la fin d'un projet. Donc, tout le projet a été construit et les gens, après, mettaient un petit peu de gender par-ci, gender par-là pour que le projet passe. Mais en fait, ce n'était pas une approche… Enfin, la manière dont le projet était formulé, déjà, il était formulé sans les gens intéressés. Donc, on faisait le constat que souvent, les projets de coopération sont écrits au nord pour être appliqués au sud, mais sans les gens intéressés. Donc, déjà… Dès la formulation du projet, il y a, il y a un problème, ce n'est pas participatif et les principales concernées ne sont pas impliquées. Donc, je dirais que dès à la base, à partir du moment où le projet il est formulé au nord sans les principales intéressées au sud, pour moi, ce n'est déjà pas de gender transformative approach. Et quand on rajoute juste le mot gender en disant comme ça, on va avoir euh, les sous, ça, ça, ça ne va pas non plus et il y a un manque de formation. Euh, en fait à, à comprendre euh, voilà, le, le principe euh, et donc ça démarre dès la formulation du, pro, du projet ce n'est pas en fait euh, quand on arrive après dans la mise en œuvre on est déjà trop tard si à la base lors de la formulation ça n'a pas été euh, déjà fait et pensé merci
Merci beaucoup, Fabienne. Merci beaucoup. Euh, il y a aussi, au fait, Ali Matou qui va revenir dans notre prochaine session pour parler euh, de ce problème aussi, parce que les gens concernés ne sont jamais euh, invités à avoir une voix pendant l'organisation et le planning de, des projets. Donc, euh, on a vraiment une session qui va euh, parler de ça euh, juste dans quelques secondes. Merci beaucoup, Fabienne. I'm going once again back in English. Um, I hope uh, and I keep hoping that this session uh, and this dialogue is helping you learn a few new things, but also understand the value of us coming together to make sure that um, gender transformative approaches are implemented. Um, I hope that we are understanding the urgency and the importance of um, the need for our communities and our societies um, to implement such things. Um, so thank you so much, Marianne and Stephanie for uh, your session it was incredible and uh, very informative um i i wish we could all give them a round of applause but it's virtual session so round of applause for you guys i will do that on behalf of the participants thank you so much um up next we have yet another session um i would like to invite uh, my next uh, speakers um my, uh, my colleague that I, I respect incredibly, um, who is um, based here in Kigali, in Rwanda, Mr. Fidel Rutaisire, who is uh, the founder of Rwamrek, Rwamrek in, um, in Kenya, Rwanda. Um, and it's a men's resource center. He is a lawyer by education and a passionate um, women's rights activist here in Rwanda. He has a master's degree in gender and development and a postgraduate degree in peace building. So he's very incredibly involved in the um, gender and feminist movement uh, here in Rwanda, my country. Um, so welcome, uh, get ready to unmute yourself and prepare your videos. Up next, we also have the great Marianne. Uh, Marianne has worked with, um, and she will be sharing greatly with her work with religious leaders. And she has a wealth of information and experience on women's rights and the elimination of FGM. She is part of the End FGM Canada Network, a human rights organization that exists for the purpose of promoting, upholding, and enforcing the human rights of girls and women residing in Canada as enshrined in the Canadian Charter. Um, so she will be here um, to talk to us about um, how girls should be protected from the practice of female genital mutilation and her work in ending FGM, um, both in her um, in Canada, in her organization, but also her community of origin. And I will go ahead and read Alimatou Berry's um, uh, biography in French. Alimatou est fo la formatrice et uh, chargée de mission au monde, uh, chargée de mission au monde selon les femmes. Alimatou est uh, form formatrice en gestion de programmes de développement avec la prise en compte de la dimension genre dans la lutte contre les violences basées sur le genre et dans les questions de la migration. Elle est également militante des droits de femmes et des enfants avec plusieurs uh, années d'expérience de, en Afrique et en Belgique. Donc, elle travaille en Guinée, en, en, au, au Mali, mais aussi en Belgique. Elle va nous partager son expérience dans, uh, dans, dans, dans sa communauté. Uh, merci beaucoup et bienvenue à Limatou, à Fidel et Marianne. Just give me a quick hello so I can know that we are together yes, in we are together. technology. Yes, Yo, I have to check in these days because technology is sometimes not on our side. Ali Matou, est-ce qu'on est ensemble? Yes, we are together, Dominique. Yes, Fidel, I hear you. I'm asking Ali Matou and Marianne. Je suis là. Merci beaucoup, Marianne. Hello, hello, hello everyone. 
Hello, yes, yes. Um, we are ready, we are ready. Um, so I am going to start with uh, Marianne. Please tell us about uh, your self brief introduction. What has been your experience in tackling uh, gender, uh, harmful gender norms? And basically, how do you implement these approaches in the work that you do? What are you passionate about and how do you do this? Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Um, Dominique has given a brief for my bio. Um, she forgot to mention I hold two masters. I have a master's in anthropology and a master's in development studies. And I have worked uh, on in this field uh, of NFGM for 15 years before coming to Canada in 2019 for studies. This is where I did my, my second master's. And um, I am a survivor, and I, I was taken to FGM when I was six years old. I, and I never questioned, I only came to question later in life when I met other Muslim girls who were not cut. And for me, that's where the whole aspect of really questioning uh, FGM from a religious perspective emanated from, because what helped me question FGM, even though I was a survivor, was honestly the understanding that it is not all Muslim girls who are cut. So I really wanted to know what was the truth. And, and I did run a project uh, funded by USID through a Population Council that was specifically working with the Somali community. And one of the reasons that the Somali community that I come from um, does FGM is the belief that FGM is Islamic. That is one thing that they believe, that's one thing they hold. So there's no way we could like scatter around that so we had to get head on we had two questions on the table is it is it islamic is it does it have any basis in islam and does it actually violate islamic teachings and islamic principles and i would be sharing that later so um personally what i do currently is i am part of the NFGM board so i'm a director in that we are trying to break the silence in canada uh, step by step day by day um, but also at an individual level, I use my social media platforms to continue to engage and to continue to talk about FGM. I also engage a lot with my Somali community through uh, my social media again, Clubhouse, Facebook. So you'll find me speaking in Somali many times if you get in there. But I'm also very active on Twitter. And, and, and as I said, I use my time, any spare time I have to continue to contribute towards the end of FGM because I honestly would never want another girl to be statistics to face what I faced. So this is who I am. Thank you so much, um, Marianne, for, for that uh, introduction. I will definitely come back to you uh, with more questions. Um, on to Fidel Rutaisire, could you uh, introduce yourself and tell us about your work that you do here in Rwanda? Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Dominique. I'm humbled and honored to be part of this forum. Uh, my name is Fidel Ruta Isire. I am uh, the executive director of the Rwanda Men's Resource Center. I am a feminist man, and I am not shy to say that uh, I really uh, promote gender justice. So I work with the RWAMREC, which is a, a feminist men's movement working with men to promote gender equality, to prevent men's violence against women through the promotion of positive masculinity. So we are based, we are working in Rwanda, but also in DRC and in Central Africa Republic. So briefly, we work to break the gender harmful, harmful norms with uh, uh, targeting of, for men and boys in their diversity. So as you know, men, are diverse, so we target men in their categories. There are different categories, men as perpetrators, men as victims, men as role models, men as agent of change, but also um, men as a solution. So that's what we do, and uh, I will get time to go into deep after. Thank you very much. Definitely. I am very curious to hear about those four uh, categories, and I'm, I'm sure the audience is as well. We will definitely come back to that. Um, Alima, too, uh, 
donc maintenant, on est en train de s'introduire votre travail sur euh, les gender transformative approaches. Um, que deal with the transformative approach. Uh, travail du jour le jour. Uh, donc, si vous pouvez vous introduire. Merci beaucoup. OK, merci. Euh, merci, Dominique. Euh, merci à... Voilà, merci aux GAMS et, voilà, et, les, et les autres partenaires de, voilà, de la communauté de pratique. Euh, donc, moi, je suis Ali Matou, comme elle vient de le, de le présenter. Donc, euh, voilà, je suis d'origine guinéenne, qui aussi euh, pratique vraiment l'excision, donc euh, à plus de 90, voilà, 96%. Et, et voilà, donc, je suis euh, militante depuis, euh, voilà, depuis euh, dans mon pays d'origine. Donc, je suis originaire de la Guinée. Et donc, je vis en Belgique depuis maintenant près de 10 ans. Et donc, j'ai la nationalité belge. Mais ça veut dire que j'ai commencé déjà à travailler sur les thématiques de violence faite aux femmes au niveau de mon pays d'origine, donc notamment la Guinée, à travers des associations, bien sûr, sur le terrain, aussi à travers la coopération, des projets de la coopération allemande. Et donc, c'est surtout les, les, les violences faites aux femmes, généralement, y compris les MGF. Et donc, lorsque je suis arrivée en Belgique, j'ai travaillé pendant sept ans quand même au niveau du GAMS parce que quelque part, je ne peux pas me présenter quand même sans me présenter aussi, euh, voilà, que je suis aussi euh, une fruit quand même de, du GAMS. Euh, donc, euh, surtout qui consistait à, à faire un travail, euh, euh, comme on appelle, euh, euh, transversal, un travail donc au niveau vraiment du terrain, c'est-à-dire euh, donc un travail de proximité avec les femmes et aussi euh, au niveau des partenaires. Voilà, donc actuellement, je travaille pour l'ONG le, le Monde sur les femmes, bien sûr, et donc, euh, voilà, qui, surtout une ONG qui travaille sur l'égalité entre les hommes et les femmes euh, dans le cadre de, de la coopération au développement. Et donc, c'est que peut-être, euh, voilà, donc je, je, peut-être pour un second temps, je vous expliquerai vraiment comment, euh, voilà, on essaye de travailler avec euh, une forme de trilogie qu'on travaille vraiment à travers des formations, des recherches, actions et surtout un plaidoyer, parce que les trois sont vraiment complémentaires. On va vraiment revenir à vous avec des, une question pour, pour avoir un peu plus d'informations sur cela. Merci beaucoup, Alimat. Um, I'm now moving back to French again. Um, yes, thank you very much. Um, Uh, Mar Marianne, Marianne uh, my question to you, um, based on your experience, how do you feel uh, religious bodies and religious leaders can play a positive role in ending and incorporate uh, gender positive approaches in their work? How can they be advocates for, for gender positive um, ideologies, behaviors, and uh, how can they challenge gender norms and stereotypes to be, to be supportive of equality? Thank you so much. Thank you, Dominique. Um, again, um, uh, audience and everyone, you will bear with me because my examples mostly will come from the religion that I belong to, Islam, so because I am not knowledgeable in, in others, and that's the example that I'll be able to give. Um, yeah, so as I said before, uh, personally, when, when I joined the, the movement, on when I began to question, and I really like wanted uh, to, to do something about this, it was 14 years of unsettlement, like I had all these questions and I wanted to do something about it. And so when I got the opportunity to really be a program officer on, on a project that was specifically going to work with the Somali community in Kenya, what I uh, came up with is I wanted this to be a religious oriented approach. And basically, if you Google that, that that's a document that's written, it will come up. And uh, that approach basically, as I said, had only two questions. Does FGM have in all its type? Does it have any basis in Islam? And uh, does it violate Islamic teachings? And we were able to really come up with another write-up that's called the linking FGM from Islam. I, I don't know, I hope I'll be able to put the links later on. I'm not very good in, in doing that, but I could send to the COP and I'm sure it's the documents that have, have been used before. So, um, uh, and basically what we did was to really delve 
into and beyond like who is a woman who's a female when it comes to this community and also uh, an Islam because majority of the community members were Muslims and always everything they did they were, would make reference to, to you know we are Muslims you know this is what Islam requires you know this and that so we had to really uh, be able to question whatever uh, standing there was on FGM from the religious perspective because it really goes beyond just being cut. Uh, because it's, it's just the whole aspect of who a woman and a female is in that community. Uh, just yesterday, I had a poem called My World, and I was talking about how um, from right from birth, like how you are unwelcome, you are, you are welcome into a world of silence, as opposed to how boys are, you know, like you related for and this announcement and there's dance and there is pomp around them. And, and that now begins to craft the way for you because you're always like unwelcome you're this person who another person is above you and when that is now justified as coming from your divine sources it becomes problematic it becomes legitimate it becomes the truth it becomes something uh, that uh, many girls have been hurt for example through fgm now uh, people thinking it is i never questioned never had a, a moment to really even question what happened to me because i knew it happens across the board to every other muslim girl and the, my day of recon and the day of opening my eyes is when i had an accidental conversation at university with with, with a muslim girl who was not cut and i believe you me I was very shocked and I was on the other side and I was speaking like the community and I was spilling the, all the stereotypes that were in my head. Your prayers did not be accepted. You are not a true Muslim. How can you not be cut? But then later on, you know, the way that small little bulb lights up in your head, I was like, but hold on, who is on the right here? <coughs> and as I said, I stayed on with that for 14 years, but the day I got the opportunity, I worked with, with, with Muslim scholars who were very knowledgeable, who were ready to delink uh, FGM from Islam, and who actually were able to educate me and also help me educate the community that many of the texts that many people use, many scholars use, is actually the text for male circumcision. It has nothing to do with FGM. And for me, that is, that is what I took, and that's how we were able to get into the community. But when we talk about religious leaders, just like when we talk about women, they are not a homogeneous community. They are not, they're not from one, one particular household, even from one particular household, depending on what number of birth you are, firstborn and lastborn, people have different expectations. And because of those expectations, you are brought up and socialized in that way. So religious scholars come from these very same social norms, come from these very same communities. And if they are not, they have never had the opportunity to sit down and question, uh, uh, for example, FGM, uh, they have been told uh, they know it is their culture and they have been told it is there in the religion. So even when they read a verse that says don't create, uh, don't change God's creation, do not cause harm, do not pour blood, do not kill, because FGM has killed, we know. Um, do not, um, um, you know, like uh, cause unhealth for someone. FGM has caused, has impact on the health of, of women and girls. We all know that. All this, even when they read, it will to make it to make a reference from that to FGM would not be easy because FGM is this norm that this normal thing that is done and they continue because I have seen that happen I have been part of the dialogues where they would confess and say you know what I have never actually sat down to to look at this thing from this perspective I have had this this book on my shelf for all these years but I have never been able to open and read and question FGM from this perspective so all I'm saying is they need first and foremost to also be engaged and who can engage we need to meet them at their spaces they, we need to be uh, to be able to use uh, strategies that are respectable and palatable to them so that they're able to sit down and, and, and really understand and engage. I could not engage them. I could not start questioning FGM with them. What I did is I had other Muslim scholars to come on board as consultants on the project. And those Muslim scholars were non-Somali, decisively chosen. Why? Because they did not have the kind of uh, cultural norms or, or cultural baggage, as I can call, as, 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 as the majority Somali scholars in the, at that particular time who are our target. So 
it wasn't me like going head on with them because in as much as I'm a Muslim, in as much as I'm educated and I can read and I can uh, like uh, analyze and make an understanding out of it, I'm still not considered a religious scholar. So it would be futile for me to go head on with them. So I think in, in, in terms of religious scholars, we just need to be able to meet them at that space and really help them begin to question this. When your humanity is discounted, when I am considered half a man, when uh, if a man is killed, you have to pay 100 camels. If a woman is killed, you have to pay 50 camels. And I'm quoting my culture here, my Somali culture. But that is justified as Islamic. Who can help us now question that? Is it Islamic? Does it have a basis in Islam? Who can help us? It's the same religious leaders. So how and I think it's, it's, it's just like when you have uh, parliamentarians in, 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 let's say, in parliament in whichever country and you expect them to pass a law and if they come from a culture and they feel, well, we cannot legislate on, on people's culture, they need also education. That's exactly what we did when we wanted to pass the, the, the FGM specific law in Kenya. We had to engage parliamentarians and educate them. It's the same strategy that we can use with religious leaders because, uh, for example, Islam, there are a lot of teachings that are very progressive. In as much as I know it has suffered the biggest blow in terms of being looked at this very gender insensitive religion, it is a very liberating religion. I can say that as a Muslim woman, and it's only because women do not know. It is in the hands of men. And it has always been presented as this patriarchal religion because it has served the power that be in the communities. It serves to really cement whatever is there in the subjugation of women. It serves the different interests. So I think it's just about how we engage, but it is possible and it, it, it's very helpful. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much, Marianne. We will definitely come back to you. There's already uh, the audience is bubbling with questions. Please be pre preparing your questions for Marianne. And if we have some time afterwards, we will come back with the questions. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to share with us. Um, I would like to jump to um, Alimatu as well. Um, so the interpretation can get ready. Um, Alimatou. Euh, donc, euh, si, si, si je, je vais essayer de parler en français, mais il y a beaucoup de gens qui considèrent euh, les approches euh, euh, transformatrices de genre euh, un truc de l'Occident. Donc, euh, euh, les gens de l'Afrique ne devraient pas être concernés, les cultures africaines ne devraient pas euh, être concernées. Et il y a beaucoup de communautés africaines qui pensent que ça ne les regarde pas. Comment est-ce que dans votre travail, parce que vous travaillez entre la Belgique et l'Afrique, comment est-ce que vous essayez à les apprendre ou les expliquer que c'est un travail important Uh, et aussi, uh, et, 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 qu'est-ce que vous faites? Uh, de, quel est le contexte? Comment est-ce que vous, vous développez des outils uh, qui aident les deux à, à se comprendre et à, à, à développer des, des, des approches transformatrices du genre? Merci beaucoup. OK, merci euh, Dominique. Comme tu viens de le dire, voilà, <coughs> le, le travail n'est pas facile. Euh, parce que, euh, comme tu viens de le dire, c'est dès qu'on parle, on parle souvent, euh, dès qu'on parle de l'aspect genre, je pense qu'on fait souvent allusion euh, à la colonisation, on fait allusion vraiment euh, à, la, -à, -dire, euh, à la lutte, c'est-à-dire euh, de, de prendre les femmes et de les mettre sur les hommes. Ou bien, dès qu'on parle de genre, la plupart du temps, par exemple au niveau du Sud, on fait un amalgame en pensant qu'on parle vraiment de de, de l'homosexualité, qu'on parle vraiment de, 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 on parle vraiment de, 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 de pousser les, les, les jeunes filles à la prostitution, de pousser les jeunes filles vraiment à, à, voilà, à la divagation. Donc, des fois, ce n'est pas facile. Il faut souvent aller, à mon avis, euh, donner l'historique la plupart du temps, parce que ce qu'on fait, c'est de dire, ne pensez pas que c'est l'Occident qui amène vraiment ce, 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 ce mot, par exemple, l'égalité, ce mot, par exemple, l'empowerment avec les femmes, vraiment le, 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 le fait que ces fa les femmes aussi se lèvent, ça veut dire pendant des années, vers les, je crois, avant la, la colonisation, les femmes déjà, euh, certaines femmes de leaders, 
se lever quand même pour dénoncer, pour dénoncer vraiment ce, 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 ce système patriarcal qui existe, qui, qui, qui fait qu'on euh, privilégie souvent les hommes au détriment des femmes. Donc, c'est surtout le système patriarcal et les normes sociales qui, sont, qui ont été instaurées dès le début qui font que ce, ce système perpétue. Donc, nous, c'est qu'on la plupart de ces conflits, une fois qu'on passe vraiment l'historique, euh, on essaye d'expliquer que ce n'est pas vraiment l'Occident qui impose, parce que euh, quand moi, par exemple, je, 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 je donne souvent ou j'introduis souvent, c'est de dire, euh, je suis aussi de vous, je suis ici euh, d'origine africaine, bien sûr, mais ça veut dire, à un certain moment, il faut se lever, parce que les autres ne vont pas venir faire le travail à notre place. C'est vraiment nous qui devrons nous impliquer en tant que femmes, en tant que militantes, en tant que mères de famille, en tant que vraiment des femmes qui sont la plupart du temps victimes de la discrimination, euh, qui doivent aussi se lever pour aller quand même dénoncer cette situation. Ce n'est pas parce qu'on dénonce une situation, qu'on dénonce une norme sociale, qu'on dise qu'on qu remet en cause. Bien sûr, on ne remet pas en cause nos valeurs. On ne remet pas en cause le fait qu'on euh, a besoin, on doit, on doit par exemple au respect, on doit par exemple dans les normes sociales, il y a des normes bien sûr qu'on encourage, mais il y a des normes qu'on normalement qu'on doit s'en débarrasser parce que c'est des normes qui sont au détriment surtout des femmes. Donc, et de, de fois ce qu'on utilise, c'est sur vous, de fois, lors des formations, c'est parce que la plupart des formations qu'on fait, c'est des formations, euh, de fois, on peut faire des formations mixtes, bien sûr, des formations avec des, des hommes et des femmes. On peut faire aussi, de fois, des formations, euh, voilà, des formations uniquement pour les femmes. Donc, si c'est des formations mixtes, donc ce qu'on fait, c'est déjà d'utiliser, par exemple, euh, des outils comme ce qu'on appelle les trois rôles. Donc, les outils de trois rôles pour amener les participants elles-mêmes à identifier quels sont les rôles qui sont assignés aux hommes et quels sont les rôles qui sont assignés aux femmes. Ou bien c'est de dire, par exemple, au niveau de ces trois rôles, c'est-à-dire dans, le, dans la sphère familiale, de faire, par exemple, la répartition des tâches. Quelles sont les tâches que les femmes occupent et quelles sont les tâches que les, femmes, les hommes occupent. Là, c'est de les amener eux-mêmes à prendre une conscience et de voir vraiment cette, voilà, cette, cette, cette division de travail qui est normalement injuste. Parce qu'on sait bien que le travail, euh, le travail déjà, bien sûr, reproductif, donc c'est surtout le rôle de la femme. C'est la femme qui prend en, en, en charge la plupart le, 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 le travail productif. C'est elle qui enfant, c'est elle qui donne les enfants, c'est elle qui élève les enfants, c'est elle qui euh, fait le travail du care, donc qui accompagne les membres de la famille. C'est elle la plupart du temps qui fait le travail au fait non visible. Et donc, la plupart du temps, c'est que les femmes, les, ce qui, quand on parle du, du, du travail reproductif, c'est-à-dire euh, en échange à, euh, avec la monnaie, avec, euh, voilà, avec de l'argent, c'est généralement les hommes qu'on voit à ce niveau-là. Donc, et puis, quand on parle aussi du travail, par exemple, communautaire, au niveau du communautaire ou bien au niveau administratif, on, via, on voit bien que c'est là où ce sont les, les hommes aussi qui sont les plus visibles, alors que les femmes aussi jouent un grand rôle à ce niveau-là. Et puis, on utilise souvent aussi euh, euh, de, 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 des outils comme le, le contrôle et l'accès. C'est-à-dire, on se dit, OK, donc on peut dire tout de suite euh, au, niveau de, au niveau de la famille, au niveau de la communauté, quels sont ceux qui ont accès à la terre, quels sont ceux qui ont accès aux ressources, quels sont ceux qui utilisent la plupart du temps. Donc, on donne des exemples la plupart du temps, ou eux-mêmes, ils donnent des, des exemples pour dire, oui, si je prends un exemple sur euh, une portion de terre, les femmes euh, peuvent, bien sûr, ce sont les femmes la plupart du temps qui font peut-être des, des, des produits ménagers, mais quand il s'agit de les vendre, c'est généralement les hommes qui les vendent. Quand il s'agit de les utiliser, la plupart du temps, ce sont les hommes qui, qui décident de les utiliser. Donc, ça questionne la plupart du temps les rapports de force. Donc, c'est comme si on amène au niveau de, de groupe, de eux-mêmes, de, de, de revoir la, la situation au niveau de la société et de dire déjà au niveau des hommes, la plupart du temps, mais de fait que la société vous met à un certain niveau du pouvoir, de fois vous donne des privilèges, mais ces privilèges-là, de fois, deviennent, vous, 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 deviennent quand même des, 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 des handicaps, deviennent de fois des problèmes 
euh, entre vous et la au niveau de la société. Parce que le fait qu'au niveau du système patriarcal, qu'on privilégie toujours les hommes ou qu'on donne toujours aux hommes les privilèges d'être le, le plus fort, le plus, euh, euh, celui qui est le, le pourvoyeur, celui qui envoie, qui entretient la famille, en, pousse vraiment à un, à un rapport de force, ce qui surtout privilégie de fois les violences, ce qui amène les violences. Parce oui. que c'est comme si chacun garde sa position de dire, donc, moi, je suis l'homme, je suis le pourvoyeur, je suis celui qui doit dominer, je suis, je suis, je suis. Donc, le fait que vous restez dans cette position-là, la plupart du temps, amène quand même à des, à des situations d'injustice, à des situations d'injustice que, deux fois, vous-même, vous, vous n'arrivez pas à contrôler. Parce que Absolument. certains... Absolument, Alimato. Oui, oui. oui on va revenir euh, sur, sur, sur ce, ce sujet, surtout qu'on a un homme avec mm -hmm. nous ici dans ce panel qui va nous parler vraiment de ce, que, de ce que les hommes sont en train de faire pour euh, régulariser ou euh, résoudre ce problème. Donc, on revient à vous bientôt, Animatou. Merci okay. beaucoup. Merci. Okay, merci. Um, yes, I am translating yet back to English to welcome my dear colleague uh, Fidel. And you're really here to talk to us about what you're doing with men through Men Engage and through the different uh, areas that you're involving men to understand gender transformative approaches, gender stereotypes, gender inequalities and inequities. What's happening on ground in Rwanda, Kenya and Central African Republic? Uh, what's working? and what's not working. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Dominique. Well, first of all, uh, let me say that working with men and boys, it's not easy. It takes time and it needs uh, uh, many tactics and many innovations because, you know, men, as I said, men are in uh, different categories. So what do we do now to work with men and boys? First, we, uh, we learn through researchers. So we do research, we find out what men want, what men need, what men prefer. And thereafter, we, uh, we develop programs accordingly. So now I'm going to share with you some of the approaches and models which we have developed in order to, um, uh, to break the harmful gender norms while we are working with men and boys. So um, my internet is not stable. If, um, uh, if you don't hear me, please let me know. Yes, so now the first approach which we have developed to work with uh, young, young boys and young uh, girls, of course, it is called uh, Youth for Change. Youth for Change, um, what, do we, what do we do in Youth for Change? So in Youth for Change, we break the harmful gender norms while we are working with boys and girls as peer mentors in promoting gender equality and adopting healthy adolescent relationships in schools, but also in communities. So we provide uh, different kinds of trainings on positive masculinities, um, positive femininities, but also we go into deep and uh, challenge the beliefs, uh, the attitudes, but the perceptions of our young boys and our young girls at uh, school level, but also in the community where the schools are. The second um, approach which we have developed is called journey of transformation, which engages couples through participatory couples curriculum training in promoting gender equality, while we also prevent domestic violence in communities, workplaces, while we also support women's economic empowerment. So this journey of transformation has been uh, evaluated and it has been able to reduce uh, physical domestic violence at 55% where we have worked from. The, the other approach which we have developed is called Bande uh, Bereho, which is a Kinyarwanda word, which means role models, as you said. Uh, it is a gender transformative intervention for couples to promote men's engagement in reproductive and maternal health, caregiving, and healthier couples' relations. 
So the, the intervention actually is a gender transformative uh, intervention, which engages men and their partners in participatory small group sessions of critical reflection um, and dialogue. So, you know, men normally like to be in safe space with their peers. So now we put them into safe space. So the intervention comprises of uh, a structured 17 session curriculum, which has been adapted from program P. Program P, P means fathers in uh, Spanish and Portuguese. And the program P is an open source manual for engaging men in maternal and child health using the gender transformative approaches. So this uh, model has been um, created by an organization called Promundo in Brazil, and it has been used in many countries. So in Rwanda, we have adapted it. We are now working with uh, community health workers, and we have even evaluated it. We did a randomized control trial, and uh, it has shown that really men can change, and men are changing. So we have been able to reduce uh, uh, gender-based violence at 45% in those uh, districts we worked from. And uh, the harmful gender norms have been broken in those districts. So another um, approach is called community scorecard. The community scorecard is also a participatory community-based monitoring and evaluation approach, which we use to enable citizens to, uh, to assess the quality of public services in dealing with gender-based violence. Um, and in this approach, we use community members, men and women as gender focal point to help us organize that process. And uh, all the researches which we have conducted have really shown that the gender transformative approaches work well when we are adapting them to the real context, especially at community level. And uh, we have learned that um, what has been helpful while working with men and boys is actually to give them a safe space for dialogue with their peers, but also um, other challenges include that uh, some of our programs are short term, and also we, we need to institutionalize the gender transformative approaches within the existing uh, structures. So thank you very much. Yes, thank you so much. Um, as someone who is experiencing what you're doing here in Rwanda, I, I just commend uh, the work of Ramrek. Um, without further ado, I would like to open this up to the audience. Again, if you have a question, you are free to either put it on the chat. I have seen a few people already who um, have uh, put on the chat their questions. If not, uh, you can raise your hand. Uh, the first first person who had raised their hand is Julia. If you're still online with us, if you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Uh, Julia, feel free to un unmute yourself. Uh, no, no, it's fine. My comment is, uh, is, not, uh, is not relevant anymore. It's, it's OK. Thank you. Okay. Pass to the next Wonderful. one. Wonderful. Okay. Um, uh, I have a question from Stephanie. Uh, I don't know if you want to ask it yourself or I should go ahead and read it. Um, uh, so she said, um, have you worked with religious, and this question is for Marianne, have you worked with religious leaders who do not only question FGM, but go further and question women's place in society and gender norms, including those affecting women's bodily autonomy and right to their sexuality, etc, etc. Stephanie, uh, feel free to uh, unmute yourself to have this quick discussion whenever relevant. Thank you. Marianne, go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, and that's why I said we took on uh, religious scholars as consultants to be able to engage with the others. 
And when we looked at uh, the two questions, so the first question was specifically on what is from the text, what is in the Quran, what is being used as evidence, does it actually apply to FGM and all that. The second part of that discussion was always about a woman's place in Islam, the rights, for example, of women in Islam that FGM violates, the right to have bodily integrity, the right not to cut healthy organs, the right to enjoy sex, the right to have health and, and you know healthy living um and and then the whole aspect of now these cultural cultures that contradict islam that is in the community and we used to go through that discounting as i said like considering women are half men and the whole issue of of of, of thinking men uh just by virtue of being given responsibility they have authority you know all those um like power dynamics those are the things we used to get into and 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 those those scholars are there they, they not only the link fgm from islam they have talked about gender in islam family planning in islam i know one in particular i don't know how many of you have engaged at ibrahim Lathome. he is there he he's outspoken and he speaks about so many different diverse islam and environment for example islam and leadership and and, and all these different uh aspects so um in this particular project, we really just wanted to lift the veil because when I was starting the project, there was a decree among the religious scholars that FGM was not a priority in that community because the Somalis live in the northern part of Kenya. It's an area that is dry most part of the year. It has a lot of droughts. They keep livestock, their livestock are dying and all this. So they have all these other pressing immediate needs, that, uh, so to speak. And so there was a decree that FGM was never a priority. So how would we begin question, questioning? Uh, how do we begin presenting this, this important topic? Because that same girl who was hungry, who was sick, who was thirsty because of all the drought and everything that was happening was still being cut, was still being denied her education. And so FGM was obviously a priority and especially for a survivor like myself. So uh, how do we come up now with ways of engaging? And that's where now the whole religious oriented approach uh, came in, where we need to sit with these guys. And just like the men, obviously there's always that fear of, are we giving them power? Religious scholars already have power. They are already the gatekeepers. They are already, um, uh, you know, like they will so much power and that power is, is considered divine. It's all, it's us to, to make use of that. And, and, and from that project, it really came out clear that at the end of the day, these are human beings who, who also are in the same socialization and the same norms and so same that if we meet them in their space, we will be able to make a lot of headway with them. That is, that was my biggest take home from, from, from that project. Like if we met them in their space, we can really leverage on that. Because if today you're working on, on gender equality, if I am considered half a man, how would you begin dealing with me in terms of really thinking, yeah. give your daughter a right, this, if there is that thinking. So we definitely need to get into that and delve, delve into that. So in that particular project, it just didn't end on was it Islamic or not. We really tried to get into um, the, all the other uh, cultural and, and, and social norms that existed. Of course, I'm talking about 15 years ago. And definitely over the years, our mindsets and our knowledge and everything has evolved. And, and yes, there is more that would have been added if it was today. I can say that. But that is actually uh, like it's, it's an important um, experience that is there. And yes, there are religious scholars who are ready and who are very progressive to be able to help this agenda. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Guzal, Guzal Nari also has a question for um, Marianne. Okay, yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, I guess my question for Marianne was that, you know, sometimes um, with the communities that we work here, uh, we work with in Sudan, um, the issue goes beyond um, religious interpretation, um, where sometimes in the communities, um, people sort of put girls on this pedestal of honor and they make them the gatekeepers of a family's honor. And so they believe that FGM decreases a girl's lust 
And, you know, even after delinking FGM from uh, religion, they still continue doing it because they think, well, if our girls are caught, then their lust is going to decrease and they're not going to stray into premarital sex. And so, you know, our family's honor is going to stay intact. And, you know, this has just sort of derailed uh, to the point where they believe that any girl that isn't cut is considered unclean. And then men in the communities sort of refuse to marry any girl that isn't cut. And I just wanted to ask if you had ever worked with communities like that who have these sort of mentalities and how did you overcome these kinds of mentalities? How did you handle that? And, um, you know, I would also like to hear from Fidel on this as well, because, you know, this in turn, this sort of involves working with men. So, um, you know, how did that go? So, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Marianne, go ahead and then we'll go. Yeah. Back. Thank you, Guzal. Uh, you you talked about uh, working in the, in, in the Sudan, and obviously that just looked like exactly a replica of of the community that I come from and that I like. I worked with the longest, the Somali. So obviously the owner is there. And and this second part of that discussion, after the linking, that second part included so many different topics, as I said. So there was a whole issue of. Uh, Islam and, 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 and sexuality. What is What does Islam teach about women and sexuality? How are we supposed to handle um, the, the whole aspect of the, the abstaining and morality in terms of uh, when it comes to sex in Islam? Is there any expectation of people being cut or, or being tied or being closed or being, you know? So all these discussions used to, but I know it's, 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 it becomes very specific at the end of the day when, when a girl's genitalia carries the owner of just not her family, but the whole community. And that's what we need to, 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 to know, like we need to get away. The, the owner is not, I shouldn't be tied to a girl's clitoris. But to be able to, to begin that question, that's where now the whole aspect was a religious oriented because if you are doing this because you think that's the owner and that is Islamic, well, it is not because Islam does not require you to cut body part in order to have your girl not straying and and we were really like would get examples and and you know when it comes to sexuality it's a double-edged sword always when you take examples of example women who were cut and and even like done the uh, like you know if gm type 3 is what we do and you give examples of don't we have words to describe the women who maybe had children out of wedlock, children born out of wedlock, which tells you this is this is just a human thing that is with us, that not every woman, uh, uh, you know, like stays as is expected. And they say, well, they do that when they are cut. Suppose they are not cut, the world will be in chaos. So it becomes a double-edged uh, sword at the end of the day. But when it comes to marriage, that is also something that my community believes that without the without FGM, a girl will not be married. But you know, certain uh, happenings really were helping us because we could see very prominent Somali men, businessmen, religious leaders, uh, members of parliament going to the coast of Kenya to marry girls, you know, like to marry women from there. And the Kenyan coast, they are Muslims, they do not practice female genital mutilation. So we just used to like always get that example of if a, a girl who's not cut will not be married, but how comes our men are actually going there? It's, it's now they are discovering a new way for themselves. So it's like they are having their cake and eating it while it's us who are suffering. So that really used to help us. And I, I know it's, it's a subject that is not so deeply even like researched on and understood when it comes to FGM and sexuality. It's if you say FGM affects women and you know like affects their sexuality, which is a fact, are we double marginalizing those who are already cut? If we say it doesn't affect, they can still function. Are we minimizing the 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 the, the, the impact that comes from it? So it's it's a even even me. It's usually like a subject that becomes very difficult. I don't I don't want to minimize the trap the, the the impact. And I do not also want to sort of like double marginalize a woman who's already been cut, a girl who's already been cut, and sort of like put a tag on her like she's frigid and all this. So um, it is it is an ongoing thing even right now. If you get if you go to my page, the Marian, you really see it is the same mentality that we're still dealing with. The same comments I get, the same even they personalize it. 
like they personalize it to me and ask me, did your husband miss any interest? You know, did he miss any taste in you? Is that why you're complaining? So they personalize it to that level. So it's something that people are still holding on to. But when we were engaging community, yes, we really used to take from the Islamic teachings on sexuality, women's rights on, on sexual enjoyment, and how we are supposed to be handling ourselves without being cut, without being hurt. Thank you I so much. That, 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 that was definitely a, be a, a very concise and uh, beautiful answer. Um, I just wanted to jump a little bit quickly to, we have a lot of questions, this is great. We have, um, only time for two more questions, and I'm really requesting the, uh, the you know, Marianne again and Fidel to keep it extremely brief. And a question here was, is there, this is for Fidel, if you can hear me, is there FGM happening in Rwanda? My understanding is that Libya elongation is going on, but there's a continuing controversy about whether it constitutes FGM, please, can you ask Fidel to address this? Yes, you can definitely come in and address this. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, as quickly yes, as you possibly can. Yes, Dominique, thank you very much. I actually responded in the chat. Yes, it exists in Rwanda. Uh, people are still practicing it, and it has been controversial. Many people are arguing that uh, it is not uh, labia minor, it is not FGM type. But uh, for me personally, I believe it is a type of FGM because it is done on small girls without their consent. And also it is a gender issue because it, uh, one of its objective is to please men. And uh, we are really condemning it. And uh, for your information, we are doing a research on it. Very soon we shall share with you the findings, but I, for me, it is a type of FGM. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, right now to Alimatou, uh, comment mesurer et évaluer l'impact des projets transforma transformateurs de genre? Comment évaluer et mesurer uh, l'impact de projets programmes transformateurs de genre? OK, merci. Uh, moi, je pense que... <coughs> Avant de parler d'abord de, de, de comment mesurer et évaluer, il faut savoir d'abord comment les intégrer, à mon avis. Donc, comme c'est que euh, je reviens à ce que Fabienne disait tout de suite, donc d'abord, euh, c'est à l'intégration pour, pour, avoir, pour pouvoir avoir vraiment de l'impact ou savoir peut-être s'il y a euh, un projet euh, voilà, a pris en compte l'aspect genre ou pas, il faut d'abord l'intégrer. C'est-à-dire, il faut l'intégrer dès le. Dès le, dès le de, de le début du projet, du projet ou du programme en partant sur euh, des, des outils qu'on appelle euh, par exemple de savoir d'abord identifier est-ce que le projet est-ce que le projet euh, est neutre est-ce que le projet prend en compte euh, les préoccupations ou les dimensions des femmes ou bien parce que ou bien le pro projet on le prend seulement dans le cadre global donc là ça veut dire on va dans les besoins pratiques d'abord des femmes parce qu'il y a les besoins pratiques et les intérêts stratégiques. Et comme elle vient de dire, l'exemple que je donne, la plupart du temps, vous le savez bien, les programmes ou les projets qu'on qu 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 met en œuvre sur le terrain, c'est des projets de foi, programmes qui, sont, euh, voilà, qui, sont, qui ont été identifiés peut-être la plupart du temps avec des politiques, avec des hommes la plupart du temps, où les femmes euh, n'ont pas leur rôle, rôle à jouer. Donc euh, là, on sait bien que des, la plupart du temps, c'est des projets qui peuvent quand même euh, ne pas aboutir, ou bien même si ça aboutit, ça n'a ça pas d'impact. Je donne un exemple, quand on va dans un village, par exemple, on a besoin, on a un projet pour un forage. Pour ce forage, pour pouvoir quand même impliquer les femmes, il faut aller d'abord, il faut aller d'abord identifier leurs besoins. Est-ce qu'elles ont besoin? Est-ce que c'est leur priorité? Est-ce que là où on pense mettre peut-être ce puits, est-ce que c'est le lieu, euh, est-ce qu'elles se sentent en sécurité à ce niveau-là? Mais on sait bien qu'on peut implanter, par exemple, ce puits et que le puits ne fonctionne pas ou que le puits n'est pas fréquenté par les femmes parce qu'on ne les a pas impliquées. Donc, à ce niveau, on peut savoir déjà dans l'évaluation qu'est-ce qui a marché, qu'est-ce qui n'a pas marché. C'est de fait peut-être qu'on n'a pas pu mettre ce projet là où les femmes en ont besoin, là où les femmes se sentent vraiment en sécurité. 
Donc, comme, euh, comme, comme par rapport à ces, on a des, des outils et des instruments, par exemple, qui peuvent nous aider à avoir ce qu'on appelle le gender mainstreaming. Donc, le gender mainstreaming peut nous permettre déjà de savoir surtout comment intégrer euh, l'aspect genre au niveau de l'identification pendant la mise en œuvre et pendant l'évaluation. Donc, euh, c'est à peu près, euh, comme on le dit, c'est vraiment aller sur la base, aller sur la base des besoins et des intérêts, des besoins réels des femmes, de, 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 impliquer, les impliquer vraiment dès le début pour qu'elles puissent quand même jouer leur rôle, pour qu'elles puissent quand même avoir euh, le temps de parole pour exprimer leur situation, pour exprimer, exprimer vraiment leurs préoccupations et maintenant aller sur la base de cela. Donc, quand je prends un exemple sur le, 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 le comment je peux appeler, sur, le, sur les, les MGF, comme on est à ce niveau-là, on sait bien, ça perpétue parce que la plupart du temps, on fait croire que c'est vraiment le problème des femmes. C'est juste des problèmes des femmes. Les hommes n'ont rien à dire. Les, noms, les hommes n'ont pas, pas, ne doivent pas s'impliquer. Et donc, on sait bien que de, dans des projets où on n'arrive on on pas à conscientiser et les femmes, les, les femmes sur surtout les, 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 les conséquences de la pratique de l'excision, de ce que ça peut engendrer. De fois, ce sont les femmes même qui peuvent s'opposer. Ça, on le sait bien que dans, dans des projets ou programmes, l'influence fait qu'on euh, qu ne, qu ne peut pas avoir quand même de bons résultats parce qu'on n'a pas, euh, dès le début, impliqué les deux couches. C'est-à-dire qu'on n'a pas essayé non seulement de travailler avec les femmes d'un côté pour leur montrer quelles sont les conséquences par rapport à ça, et aussi travailler avec les hommes qui ont quand même une influence à ce niveau-là, qui ont une influence sur la relation, euh, relation homme-femme, sur la relation sur les violences sexuelles, comme on le sait. Donc, euh, il suffit peut-être d'expliquer à un homme, même si euh, c'est un religieux, comme on vient de le dire, que la conséquence néfaste sur la santé de la femme est liée aussi à la pratique de l'excision. Le fait que la plupart du temps, peut-être la femme qui ne ressent pas assez de plaisir, près suffisamment de plaisir, est liée à ça. Le fait que peut-être ces enfants qui sont la plupart du temps, peut-être arrivent à tomber souvent malades, que c'est lié à ça. Pour que l'homme aussi puisse quand même euh, arri arriver à avoir une prise de conscience et surtout déconstruire les croyances, les croyances qui ont été toujours euh, voilà, mises en, av en avant. Voilà, Absolument. je ne sais pas si peut-être euh, j'ai essayé de, de faire un petit résumé. C'est très bien fait. Merci beaucoup. Et j'aimerais aussi euh, remercier, bien sûr, euh, Fidel. Uh, thank you so much, Fidel. And uh, thank you so much, Marianne. Um, unfortunately, we have to close this very engaging discussion. On doit vraiment fermer parce que uh, on a, on a, c est, c est, c est, it's very engaging. It's very... Um, People are asking many questions, but we don't have the time. On n'a pas assez de temps pour répondre à toutes les questions, mais je vous encourage de continuer à, à, à parler avec IDOS, à parler avec nos, nos partenaires, uh, GAMS Belgium. Uh, comme ça, la conversation et le dialogue continuent. Donc, je vous remercie et je remercie tout le monde qui est venu euh, dans, cette, euh, dans, cette, euh, euh, dans ce dialogue, dans ce, ce webinaire. I really would like to take the time to thank everyone. And uh, we are getting to the time of closing. I would like to invite the ADOS team to give us our closing remarks, uh, followed by uh, one of our sponsors, uh, Julie de Dubois, uh, for closing remarks as well. And once again, I would like to thank everyone for your beautiful engagement. Oui, merci, merci Dominique. Je suis donc Clara Caldera de l'Association italienne Femmes pour le Développement, IDOS. Nous sommes ravis d'avoir eu l'occasion d'organiser ce dialogue car il nous semble qu'enfin, en parlant d'approche transformatrice de genre, on, on touche au vif du sujet, c'est-à-dire au fait que les MGF, les mutilations génitales féminines, comme toutes les formes de violence basées sur le genre, sont un symptôme de l'inégalité de genre et d'un système hiérarchique 
qui voit les femmes dans une position euh, de fait subordonnée aux hommes et qui les empêche donc de réaliser pleinement leurs droits et de décider pour elles-mêmes et sur leur propre corps. Mais euh, pendant tout le dialogue et aujourd'hui aussi, on s'est quand même demandé que veut dire finalement travailler avec une approche transformatrice de genre euh, derrière cette terminologie qui peut poser problème d'ailleurs dans les différents contextes et, et, et pas, pas qu'en Afrique. Euh, en fait, que veut-on transformer exactement euh, Pendant le dialogue, nous avons conclu entre autres et nous l'avons vu aujourd'hui que ce qu'on veut transformer véritablement, c'est la société tout entière. C'est le système patriarcal que nous avons tous et tout intériorisé et contribué à perpétrer, que ce soit euh, voilà, dans les communautés euh, qui pratiquent les MGF ou que ce soit dans d'autres communautés, que ce soit en Europe, en Afrique ou en, en ailleurs. Ou ailleurs, c'est vraiment dans toutes les sociétés. Et euh, ce, ce, ce travail doit être fait à plusieurs niveaux, au niveau d'abord individuel, sociétal, relationnel, institutionnel, juridique, on l'a vu tout à l'heure, religion, religieux, etc. Donc, euh, impliquer bien sûr les filles et les femmes en les mettant au centre, mais aussi celles et ceux qui ont plus de pouvoir à l'intérieur d'une société donnée, notamment les hommes et dans certains contextes, les femmes plus âgées. Mais en, tout en faisant bien attention à ne pas renforcer ultérieurement leur pouvoir, mais au contraire, en renégociant leur rôle pour aller vers des rapports de genre plus égalitaires qui, au final, vont bénéficier tout le monde et, euh, et qui, donc, vont mettre les filles et les femmes au centre et dans la condition de décider pour elles-mêmes. Les approches de transformatrice de genre, donc, euh, sont des approches qui ne doivent pas être vues que, euh, comme des approches qui concernent que les filles et les femmes, justement. Et en s'attaquant aux causes profondes des mutilations génitales féminines et donc de la violence basée sur le genre, euh, finalement, non seulement nous allons vers l'abandon de cette pratique, mais on a beaucoup plus de chances que cet abandon soit vraiment, véritablement durable. Donc, c'est une tâche extrêmement ambitieuse qui demande du temps, comme nous l'avons dit euh, euh, tout au long de ce webinaire, qui demande aussi beaucoup de courage, car il s'agit de questionner et de renégocier les rapports de pouvoir entre les genres, les privilèges des hommes, les normes et les valeurs de genre, la façon dont on éduque les enfants, par exemple, tant en famille qu'en milieu scolaire, la façon dont on travaille dans nos propres organisations, euh, les lois, l'application des lois, bref, ça touche vraiment tout tous les domaines, mais c'est absolument faisable. Ce dialogue n'est qu'un début. La conversation continue sur la communauté des pratiques, comme ma collègue Stéphanie l'a dit tout à l'heure. Et nous invitons véritablement tout le monde à s'approprier du rapport final et de ses recommandations pour les porter à l'attention de décideurs et de décideuses et des bailleurs. Et bien sûr, nous ferons, la, nous, nous, nous ferons bien sûr la même, la même chose. Et les bailleurs et les décideurs et les décideuses aussi doivent être ambitieuses et ambitieux et courageux et courageuses. Donc, je termine par, puisque moi, j'ai vraiment que cinq minutes, par remercier toutes les participantes et les participants de ce dialogue international qui ont participé donc à tous les travaux de, de groupe pour avoir emmené leurs compétences, leurs expériences et, et aussi beaucoup de passion dans les discussions. Et, et vraiment, merci beaucoup. Et je remercie bien sûr l'initiative Spotlight pour l'élimination des violences faites aux femmes et le programme conjoint NFPA UNICEF sur les mutilations génitales féminines. Merci. Merci beaucoup, Clara. Et euh, en finissant, je voudrais aussi appeler euh, Julie, Julia Dubois. Uh, if you could come and unmute yourself for your closing remarks. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much. So I would like to thank IDOS, Gambelgion, and the NFGM European Network for organizing this dialogue. And of course, all the Brian speakers who accepted to share their experience. So we all recognize the importance to invest in scaling, scaling up promising practice uh, that aim to transform gender norm to eliminate FGM. So we, we all know that we, we only have nine years left 
to achieve SDG and to organize a social movement that strengthens the voice of girls and, and women. We also need to work more with men and, and boys as uh, allies. And uh, very, uh, thank you very much, Fidel, for, for, your, for, your, for sharing your experience. So we know that we are working in a challenging environment and it's not easy uh, to succeed in a changing gender norm. So the report and the discussion we had today show us some example of, uh, of these challenges. But we also uh, have uh, some good example from the field, from the field like uh, all experience from Mariam and, uh, and Ali Matu. And also, for example, in Ethiopia, uh, where UNICEF has developed the first ever program level, uh, FGM gender equality strategy, or in Guinea uh, with an innovative approaches on a model men and women's mentor. So as we know that the gender transformative approach take time and efforts, we also recognize that if there are progress, we are not on track to achieve SDG 5.3. And we are facing many challenges, including significant underfunding. So prior to the pandemic, UNFPA estimated a total of 2.1 billion shortfall. In total, funding required to end the practice. So new source of fi financing are required to achieve priority areas in the elimination of FGM. And one potential solution to this severe funding shortfall is innovative financing. So we need to think about it, and it will be the, the, the objective of the next annual meeting of the FGM Donor Working Group, which will be held tomorrow. So we are working with the European Network to hold a dedicate FGM Donor Working Group meeting with civil society on innovative financing on first quarter 2022. And we, we hope to meet there, to meet you there, to engage with the donor on the situation and propose solution on how to go forward. So thank you very much for, 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 for organizing this very, very uh, interesting conversation. And uh, yes, keep, uh, we keep uh, going on to discuss on this subject. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Julie and uh, Clara. Uh, this was an absolute honor to, to share these two hours with everyone who is present. Uh, before I let you go, there is a quick form on the chat group, everyone, if you could just click on it so it's open and then you can fill it on your own time. And the second thing before we go, I would like for us to take a group photo. Um, uh, to everyone who can switch on your cameras very quickly, just uh, as a souvenir for people who have participated in this dialogue, then we will take a group photo. Yes, I see everyone switching on your cameras. This will not take more than one minute. Uh, and then those on the technology, if you can take uh, this beautiful screenshot. Um, Wonderful. I have taken the first photo. Uh, the second page, if everyone can just switch on your videos for just one second. Thank you so much. And we are very grateful that you've decided to tune in. This was very successful. Yes. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, and I think you can hear the little click. Yes, and then the third photo, um, as everyone keeps switching on your, your cameras. Yes. Yes, thank you for the smiles, everybody. There we go. I have taken all the photos. Um, this is just to say thank you for your support on behalf of ADOS, on behalf of GAMS, and on behalf of all the sponsors of this event. We thank you for engaging into changing the world into a more gender transformative world and society. Thank you once again. Clap for yourselves and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs>